Well, the Dupree Thinking Alliance was founded by a group of parents, as many parent passion advocacy groups are. Um, it was founded in the late 90s when they identified the gene variant that causes Dupree Thinking Q syndrome, um, starting with the isodicentric form, and then we have learned more about the interstitial form as well. Um, and then we incorporated, we're actually celebrating our 15th year this year of incorporating, being an incorporated nonprofit. And now we're, we're following about 1,700 families worldwide um, that we support both um, by connecting them to other families that are in their same area geographically, as well as the other families that are going through the same clinical kind of presentation or being a typical presentation of their children. So it really um, kind of goes soup to nuts on that one. Um, and then we really push for research and better clinical care for the kids that are um, struggling and helping families do that and how they find the best doctors that can support them. And also educating physicians um, from our clinical experts to all the way down to you know those rural or smaller hospitals that are seeing the kids on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so U15Q syndrome is a genetic condition that it, can, it takes two different genetic forms. One's isodicentric, which ends up end up with an extra chromosome. So you have 47 chromosomes instead of 46. And then there's an interstitial format, which actually you have 46 chromosomes, but the extra piece is on that existing 15Q. Um, what ends up happening is that kids are generally um, low tone when they're born. They're a little bit floppy. Um, and they miss the motor milestone. So that's kind of the first presentation and some, sometimes the first red flag that they see. Um, then a fair amount of our children, about 30 to 30 to 35 percent, will go on to have infant health spasms, um, which are um, kind of catastrophic seizures and really an emergency when it comes down to um, that brain development period when kids are having all of this kind of explosive stuff happening, and then on top of it, put seizures in there. Um, then kids kind of tend to miss their language milestones, so they don't talk as early. Um, they start missing social milestones, um, and oftentimes they're diagnosed with language, language disorder, um, social deficits, and most of the time, often autism, or a form of autism. We're kind of called DQTQ autism, which is a little bit different than what you think about for idiopathic autism. Um, right now, we're looking at the prevalence or the incidence. We, we really don't know. But we, we think it's about one in eight to 10,000 live births. Um, so it's we follow about 1,700 families worldwide, but we're thinking there's many, many more that are either undiagnosed or walking around with a, you know, an autism diagnosis or an epilepsy diagnosis, and that's kind of where they stop. Um, they don't go and get the gen genetic um, diagnosis that would lead them to do 15Q syndrome. Uh, the diagnostic journey for people with do 15Q syndrome has really changed over the past 20 years or 25 years since they've been around. Um, oftentimes at the beginning, it took a while. They kind of, they had the language disability diagnosis, they had the autism diagnosis, and that's kind of where it stopped. Um, and then genetics kind of came along. Um, the whole gene, not the gene craze, but the identification that there are things caused by genes. Um, and so you went from being, a di being diagnosed around the age of 10 or 15, to now we have diagnosis even prenatally. Um, so even over my three years as executive director, I've seen the family, the, the age of the families that I call go from seven or eight to now I'm down to, like usually the average is around two now um, because we've been added to the epilepsy panel. So when kids have epilepsy, um, there's a genetic panel that, they can be, that they can be wrong and we're on that panel. So we oftentimes have kids that are coming in. They don't know that they have anything other than seizures and they'll come in and say, well, I have DQ syndrome based on the genetic panel. The same thing goes that we've been on the edits to the autism panel. Um, so we are one of the larger, the largest genetic reasons for, or genetic causes for autism. Um, it's us and tuber sclerosis and a couple other ones that are, um, that are more single gene variants. Um, and so being on that panel really, really helps families identify and really know the cause because when it comes down to it, finding the reason for what's going on is really, really helpful for a lot of families. It's really comforting. Even if we don't have treatments yet, um, it's really comforting to find their people in their community and be able to connect with those who really understand what they're going through.